You are now listening to the Hunter's Advantage Podcast. We preserve the history and sport of hunting through curious conversation and action-packed hunts, as well as offering you tips and strategy for more successful hunts. The Hunter's Advantage podcast is powered by Out on a Limb Manufacturing. Out on a Limb is a family-owned company based right here in Oklahoma that makes tree stands, saddle platforms, climbing sticks, and so much more. Christian, I have a quick question. What's that? What bites sound harder, a hippo or an alligator? No idea. It's a trick question. The Ridge Runner 2.0 bites harder than both of them. But all jokes aside, we use these products all across the land on public or private. These help us get into any tree we want and hunt where the deer actually are. Most men go to the grocery store for their meat, but these products help you go to God's grocery store. I have used the Out on a Limb Ridge Runner 2.0 and the Shakar Sticks for the last few years hunting public land bucks, and I've actually shot several bucks out of this setup. If you want to support the podcast and get some Out on a Limb equipment, make sure to go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA10 for 10% off at checkout. Once again, if you want to support the podcast, go Go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA10 at checkout for 10% off. Now let's get back to the podcast. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hunters Advantage podcast, episode number 183. And I'm joined by nobody, just me this week, a solo episode. I can't remember the last time I did just a solo episode, but I like to do these from time to time. And... Sometimes it's out of necessity because somebody gets sick. I had food poisoning like the last week and a half, so we've been kind of behind on recording podcast episodes. But I do have a cool one uh, for you guys today. I'm going to do some Q&A that we got from a lot of the Facebook community. So I think it's fun uh, to just sit and do Q&A sometimes. It kind of brings up different parts of my brain when you're talking about hunting and asking different questions. And I'm... No, I am no expert in every area of hunting, so I don't want to come off that way. But uh, I, if I don't know the answer to a question, I'm just going to say it and I'll defer to my experience on the other ones. So I just got back from Nebraska uh, mule deer hunting. If you listened uh, to the Wired to Hunt podcast this week on the Rut Fresh radio segment with The Element, uh, I got on there and talked about some whitetail and mule deer hunting and some of the conditions we were seeing up in Nebraska. Uh, it was a really fun hunt. Uh, I'll just foreshadow and come out with it for a little, just right out of the gate. Uh, I had food poisoning for like six days up in Nebraska, and we're going to do a full podcast about that mule deer and whitetail hunt here coming out probably next Tuesday. So I'm going to, I'm going to save that, uh, whole story for then we did not get a mule deer, but it was an awesome hunt. And, uh, I had a, a different kind of battle that I was fighting while I was up there. But anyways, had some cool encounters, really enjoyed Nebraska, plan on going back this year. Season's approaching quickly. I can't believe it. I can't believe we're two weeks out from deer season. It's so awesome. Uh, but with that, what we're going to do in this episode is it'll probably be pretty short and sweet, probably try to keep it under 45 minutes, and I'll just be answering questions from the Facebook community. If you guys ever want to like give us a topic or give us something that you want to hear about from us, whether it's, you know, hunting over bait or an ethics question or a strategy or a tips question. We try not to be a super tips heavy channel just because, man, what's happens in Southeast Arkansas is so different than happens in Northwest Kansas, which is so different than happens in central Illinois we try to give general advice when people ask and try not to just throw our opinion around and just talk about the experiences that we have. Cause we can really only talk about the stuff that we have experience with. But if you guys do want to send in Q and a, we post like TikToks uh, and Instagram reels and YouTube shorts from time and on Facebook too, from time to time, just asking for good topics or questions that you guys want to hear us discuss on the podcast. So if that's something you're interested in, just make sure to uh, leave us a message or look out for one of those videos, or you can send us a message on any platform, and uh, we usually take care of those uh, pretty quickly. But with that, it'll just be me this episode, and I'm going to be digging into some of the questions that we got from Facebook here. So number one comes from DJ 
Rifle, or maybe Riffle, it's R-I-F-F-L-E. He had a pretty pretty vague question, but he said, first hunter season recommendations with a new hunter. Interesting. So, oh, it's not even DJ, it's D-I. Uh, first season recommendations. Have fun. <laughs> I think, uh, man, if you were listening to some people's podcasts, in the outdoor industry, they'd probably shove tips, tactics, gear, must haves, must do's down your throat. Just know that in deer hunting or any type of hunting you're doing, there's no absolutes. There is no replacement for, uh, the school of hard. I'm, I guess hard knocks is, is one way to say it. I don't want to sound try and try to sound tough when I say that, but there really is no replacement for getting out there and doing it. That's how you learn to deer hunt. You can only listen to so many podcasts. You can only listen to so much information before you go out and apply it on your own. So first season recommendations would be whatever method you're hunting with, whether that be a muzzleloader, a rifle, a crossbow, a regular bow, a recurve, go out there and hunt as early and as often as you can. Um, if it was me and I had to get one piece of advice, I would just be hunting places where I think deer are, whether that be agriculture fields or food sources like acorns in the middle part of October, look out for things like that and look for the thickest area on properties on whatever property you hunting, whether that's a thick grass or that's thick, uh, timber cover or, you know, maybe just the thickest area of the property to try to find some sort of bedding where deer are going to live and then going, you know, experiment how close you can get, uh, with that and then play the wind, making sure your wind is blowing away from that bedding area as you approach it. And apart from that, just have fun, man. Don't take it too seriously. Uh, don't, I know a lot of folks that, you know, they haven't even shot a deer yet and they're so they're already worried about what class of deer, what age of deer they want to shoot. no, Go out and have fun. That would be my recommendations. And, and try to find a mentor. Find somebody that'll take you that knows halfway what they're doing. You know, a guy that's been hunting for five years is going to be exponentially more down the path than you are. So I would just get someone like that in my life. And if not, go out there and learn on your own. You know, there's there's no replacement for that. And, and have fun, man. And num- question number two is from Chad Richard. Uh, so Chad is from get more game recovery. Yeah. We had him on the podcast talking about shot selection and uh, recovering deer with dogs. That was a pretty good episode, but Chad said, would today's hunters be successful 30, 40, 50 years ago? Today's hunters have so many tools to use too many to list back. Then you had boots on the ground, eyes and ears. Would today's hunters be successful 30, 40, 50 years ago? Uh, definitely not as successful. I don't, I don't think so. I think you take a, you know, there's a lot of people that are really reliant on those tools, whether it be trail cameras or mapping or, uh, hell cell cameras is a really big one, you know, more efficient weapons during either the archery season. Hell there's muzzleloaders now that'll shoot 600 yards. (laughs) I'm really out of the rifle and muzzleloader game because I have no idea how that works, but yeah, I, I think people would struggle to be as successful, but I also think they're the inverse of that is we're more successful. The top end people that know what they're doing are more successful than they've ever been. I think a guy, I think those tools do make us better hunters if used in the right way. Uh, you know, people with cell cams are definitely know which place to hunt and where to put the majority of their time. Whereas people that did boots on the ground, you know, you're limited to, the times that you can only be out there. So I think we're, yeah, we're more reliant on technology as a hunting community now than we've ever been. But the inverse of that is I think the people that use that technology correctly are more, they're more deadly than they've ever been. And I think the short answer is no, you take the average person who's extremely reliant on cell cameras and they don't go out unless their cell cam sends them a good notification of a buck during daylight And, um, you know, they don't have on X, so they won't go more than three or 400 yards into a piece of public because they don't have woodsmanship or know how to find their way around and how to navigate in the dark. No, they're probably not going to be nearly as successful. I remember when my, I first started hunting public land with my uncle, 
it was in the mountains <laughs> and it's just, if you've hunted uh, pines and, you know, clear cuts and those sort of things, it can be super monotonous and super, everything kind of looks the same. And he would just drop me off and be like, all right, 300 yards that way. You're going to see this and you're going to see this. I'm like, well, what if I don't? He's like, I don't know. Just sit down on the ground and I'll pick you up when I'm done. Okay. So that's kind of how I learned. And it's, it's trial by fire. I, I mean, there was definitely situations where I sat under the tree for 30 minutes looking around and then, you know, right at daybreak, you start to see the little pieces of flag tape that your uncle did leave and you do end up getting up in the right tree, but you only learn that stuff through being out there. And I don't know. I think people are, would definitely not be the average person is not going to be nearly as successful, uh, 40 or 50 years ago as they are today, but it's, it's the evolution of, sports is the evolution of hunting you know it's like you take a guy in the ufc from 30 years ago and you put him against an average guy today he's probably going to get his clock cleaned and the only reason is that is the evolution of the sport you know he they understand techniques better they understand training recovery it's the same thing with hunting we understand all these things better we really do there's an endless amount of information there's an endless amount of technology um which i think we're pretty reliant on in some ways. And if you take all that away, I, I just don't think you're going to be nearly as effective, but, uh, it's a good question. It's a good thought. I've heard several podcasts talk about that. And a lot of them are in the context of, you know, woodsmanship, people lacking woodsmanship. I think that would be the main thing that, uh, I would be interested to see how people of today would react 30, 40, 50 years ago. But it's a really good question, Chad. So question number three comes from Dustin Hogue. What are your thoughts on other hunters coming next to your tree and saying it's their spot? Have multiple people do this to me because they know I've killed deer there. Interesting. Well, Dustin, I can only assume that you're hunting on public land because if a guy walked up to my tree on private and said, this is my spot, he'd probably get a, a people's elbow from the top rope. <laughs> or or one of those Ray Mysterio 619s spinning around the ropes with a kick to the face. Um that's frustrating. I one, I I'd be confused why people know exactly where you're hunting. Uh so maybe loose lips sink ships in some sort of ways. I'd be very careful on who I'm sharing information uh with. I mean, deer hunting is a pretty if you want to kill big deer, deer hunting is a pretty lonely game. Like there's there's trail cam pics and there's pictures and there's onyx pens that I wouldn't share with my wife if she asked, you know, I'm just kidding, but I, there's, there are legitimately, there's information that I wouldn't share with most people if they asked in the context of hunting, because big deer and deer, good deer in general, especially on public land are so rare that it's not easy to find them. And it's a heck of a lot harder to even to kill them. So I just be very cognizant of what information that I'm sharing. And then if it's on public land, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it is just as much their spot it is, is as it is your spot, but I'd be worrying what kind of people or you know, what context the people have, uh, these friends or these people that aren't friends. It sounds like they're just a bunch of toolboxes that, you know, know that you've killed deer in a spot and they do that to you. What I would do would be, if that consistently happened to me, I probably would give up that spot and would probably go somewhere else and maybe find a way to access places that maybe are a little bit harder to get to or places where, you know, you park your truck and you can really go in four directions. So you got a lot, uh, you got a lot less likelihood of people walking up on you like that. But I don't know. That one's kind of a, that one's kind of a hard one, my man. It's not a, it's not an easy situation to be in. And I mean, I've had people do that to me, walk up on me. Thankfully, most of the situations that I've been on public land, when people walk up on me and I, you know, give them the wave, they typically move on. But I have had people set up two or 300 yards away from me and call, you know, play the grunt flute and, you know, play the rattle bag, like they're in an orchestra and in those situations, I, I tend to just walk away and find a, find another spot. I think this is 
this is a really good lesson in why you have multiple, multiple spots on public land to hunt, not getting married uh, to just one spot. Because if you do that, you're going to be very, very disappointed in the long term because people will do this stuff to you. I mean, there's a lot of folks that are going that would have no problem walking up and getting in the tree next to you and wouldn't blink about it. But I'm sorry you're dealing with that situation. That's probably how I'd handle it. I'd try to maybe not share any information, be in places where it's kind of hard for people to exactly pinpoint where you're at, unless it's a really good spot or you're after a really good buck. And then the third thing would just be if people are, uh, people are willing to do that to you, I'd, I'd have multiple spots. That would be how I'd kind of mitigate my risk in that situation. Dave number four is from Dave de France. He says, how about sublease? leased land, lease 2000 acres for $20,000 and, and subleasing or selling three and six day hunts. I know this is the, what you just described as an outfitting business. And I know a lot of folks that operate that way. They lease large chunks of land and uh, sell three, six day hunts. or they sell waterfowl hunts. I don't have any problem with people doing what they enjoy. I mean, conservation and conservation of the resources you know, there's not a one size fits all solution. I would say people, I would hope that people would do what is best for that land. You know, you see a lot of folks that have, maybe they have a thousand acres to outfit on and they go in and they shoot eight bucks. Was that what's best for that area? Probably not. So, I mean, I understand it from both sides. One side, it's a business and, you know, people have the right to do that. The other, other side is I have absolutely no problem with people doing that as long as they're conservation mind and they're doing what's best for the herd and uh typically what's best for the herd and what's best for your pockets are not the same thing so that's what i that's what i'd worry about in that situation mark bruner number question number five he says hunting mature bucks that is feeder shy here in texas his bed and route on an adjacent private property but he will cut through my hunting property periodically interesting so me, Jake Payton have had very extensive, interesting conversation when it comes to hunting bucks, um, on feeders, because I hunt an area where it seems like the culture of the deer has been built up to where they don't mind feeders. Like they will, uh, they'll use them to, to so a, a good example of this is I have a buck now, probably 125 inch eight point. He's a really good buck, got good eye guards. He's probably got nine inch G twos, you know, but the only issue with him, it's not really even an issue at all. It's an issue for score, but he probably has a three inch G three on one side and a one inch on the other side. So he's basically, he's pretty much a six point and he's a seven and a half or a six and a half year old deer. And the only reason I know that is when I first picked up this lease in 2021, um, he was in a lot of the pictures and he had the same eye guard or sorry, the same G threes the entire time, just super short, uh, little bitty suckers. He's had them his entire, uh, I think every set of horns he's had that I've seen at least. Um, but that deer, I say that to say this, that deer is at the feeder every morning, every evening. And some days he even hits it in the midday. And I was having a conversation with Peyton today and he, he said, I think that is our most consistent deer does and everything. So like this deer is the most consistent out of all the deer and he's there before all the does he's there after all the does, whether it's the morning or the evening and he's okay with feeders and he's a mature deer. Well, there's a, also another subset of deer on the property. We have a buck, uh, that is a really wide, probably 22 inch wide. Um, he's probably a 22 inch wide 10 point. I mean, he's really an eight point, but he's mainframe eight point. He's got little nubs and a couple kickers. This buck is anti feeder, but he's one of the bigger bucks on our properties. And it's kind of driving Peyton nuts because this buck, there is an oxbow on our deer lease. And basically what it is, it's a bunch of elm trees and kind of like driftwood. It's, it's kind of more of a flood area. And it's this oxbow that kind of in the river and it's real, real thick, just a really good bedding area. Well, we have a camera in between 
the oxbow uh, where it kind of funnels out into a, a big open uh, hay meadow and then goes to the northern portion of the property where there's a feeder. We always catch that buck coming out of that bedding area. We catch him coming out of it and we catch him going back into it. And he's always doing it. You know, uh, he's obviously not going to walk by the same tree every single time. So we don't get a video of him every day, but we get a couple, probably a couple of videos of, of, of him a week doing that exact same thing. That deer has only hit a feeder one time in the 90 days that we've known about him, which is pretty discouraging because we thought, Hey, we have a culture on this place of deer, not, not being weary of feeders. Well, they, they really have no reason to be weary of feeders because the deer that have been shot off the property, it's the property has only been hunted three days in the last two years. I've been using the new Exodus rival cell camera for the last couple months, and I have found a beautiful mainframe eight point with tons of stickers to go after this fall. Ooh. One thing I do appreciate about Exodus trail cameras is all of the cameras share the same data plan, so you only pay for what you need. A lot of cell cam companies charge you for HD pictures. I've seen prices of $5 for 50 HD pics. Exodus is going to give you unlimited HD pictures right to your phone, which is awesome when you're sitting there in the middle of the summer and it's 100 degrees and you just want to binge a bunch of trail cam photos. If you're looking for a solid cell camera with great performance and a five-year no BS warranty, go check them out. So as we all know, hunting gear is something people can make way too complicated. Arrows can be the exact same way. Instead of going down all those rabbit holes, trying to sift through the endless information that's online, and you're not really sure if it's right or wrong, Exodus makes it simple to get the right arrow for your exact setup. So go online to the Exodus Arrow Builder. It takes less than a minute. You're gonna enter your draw weight, your draw length, and how heavy of a point you're shooting. And it's gonna be that simple. Let the guys at Exodus take care of the rest. So if you're interested in Exodus Rival cell cameras or a new set of their MMT arrows, just go to exodusoutdoorgear.com and use code HA15 for 15% off anything on the website. Once again, that is exodusoutdoorgear.com. Use code HA15 at checkout for 15% off. Now let's get back to the podcast. So there's not a lot of a negative association with those feeders. It's not like we're going in there and blasting does and then does are getting used to seeing other deer getting picked off by the feeder and they're not attributing anything negative uh, to the feeder. So there's really no reason at all for that buck to act that way. But if I've learned anything through talking to people, smarter people than me, like Dr. Bronson Strickland or uh, Dr. Marcus Lashley or uh, Kip Adams or Matt Ross from the NDA is every deer is so unique on their personality. They all have different things that make them tick. They all have different personalities. Some of them, uh, they have, you know, if you listen to the episode we did with Marcus Lashley about deer diets, a deer's diet is changing with every single breath on what it needs. It has an ability to regulate its own diet. And there's over a hundred different browse uh, things that are edible to a deer at any given time. So some deer might like corn, some deer might not. And what the situation that you're describing is really interesting because he's feeder shy. One, I would ask myself, well, why is he feeder shy? Is it his personality or is it something in the culture of how I hunt this place that makes bucks feeder shy? Do I wait when there's two or three, two or three year olds on the, um, on the feeder and there's a bunch of does, but I want to shoot a doe. So I'm, I'm going to do that. That might not be a, a bad thing. Just know that every time that you introduce something negative with that feeder, it has a consequence. So when you shoot a, a doe on that feeder, when there's two or three young bucks on it, they're going to remember that. Now, I don't think in like a super cryptic way, like they have a, a deer library that they go back to with all their bad experiences. And they, on December 14th, a doe was shot and I, I'm never going back to the feeder. I don't think so. I think that's just instinct and it's survival. But I would ask myself one, why is that, that he's feeder shy? Is it something that I'm doing on the property or am I going in to fill the feeder too often? Is there too much human intrusion on the feeder? Am I messing with it too often? Am I checking my trail cameras too often? You know, there's really no reason to go in there except for when the feeder is out in my mind, unless you're checking an SD camera or fixing a cell camera or something to that extent. But I would ask myself those two questions. Is there anything that's, that's that I'm doing that could negatively be impacting this buck? 
And then on top of that, I would also um, be trying to find out if it if it's not one of those two things. So another thing that I can control. Okay, now what patterns is he doing that I can exploit? What ridge is he coming? What dry creek bottom is he coming? What piece of topography is he using when he's accessing my property? And you're, what you said in your question is he'll cut through my property periodically and his bed and his bed and route are on the adjacent property. So what you're saying is the majority of his time that he's spending is on the other property and you're not on his core area. So if you're not in his core area, what can you do on your property, the places that he cuts through periodically? Is there any data you can derive that would help you understand when and why he does that? Is it on a cold front? Is it to access a certain food source that's two properties over? Is it he only does it on a particular wind direction? You can get that granular and try to figure it out and kind of reverse engineer some of those things. Or you can just set up a, a, a stand where he comes through periodically and hunt it when the, when the wind is right and enjoy it. It's kind of up to you. I mean, hunting is such an, such an individual thing. And that's what I love about it. If there's people that want to sit and obsess over a trail camp photo and look at every single little data point that is going to help them get an edge or at least something they perceive to help them give an, get an edge. And then there's the other side of it where there's people that just want to go out and hunt and have fun. If you're not taking it, uh, if, if it's the latter, just set up a, set up some sort of stand or blind where you can hunt him on the right wind and hope he comes through your property. And another thing you can do is staying out of your property and giving yourself little to no, you know, pressure on the place while your neighbor hunts him. If you, if that is the case, that's another really good strategy. Trying to stay out of this is a buck that you really, really want to kill. Let your neighbor push them to you. Um, I don't know enough about your unique situation to say much more than that, but uh, that's what I'd recommend. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps. So the next one is from Mark Bruner. Oh no, I just, I just read Mark's Brian Graves. He says bow hunting, highly pressured public land. I thought you'd never ask Brian. <laughs> we do this a lot. and. I think it's fun for the most part. We hunt public land in Oklahoma. I have hunted public land in Texas. I have hunted public land in Nebraska. I have hunted public land in Kansas. I uh, spent a lot of time in Kansas actually last year hunting public land uh, and pretty pressured public land. I mean, during the first week in November uh, last year, we did a we did a 14 day trip where we did half in Oklahoma and half in Kansas. Well, what happened uh, in Kansas is the first three sits. So first a day and a half in Kansas, I got walked up on eight times, whether that be with hikers. And then, um, one of those situations looking back on it was funny, but as it was happening, it really pissed me off. But as it was happening, uh, I was, so what happened was Peyton was hunting this area. It was a really good, uh, like winter wheat field surrounded by deep, like dry creeks and, uh, it had, you know, a good amount of oaks and a really mature timber and bedding around this oak field or sorry, this uh, wheat field. And Peyton was hunting one edge of it. So what had happened was I walked in with him and I'm like, okay, you stay here. I'm going to trail this entire edge of this wheat field and kind of hug the Creek. And I'm going to get on the other side where there's more bedding with the right wind and wind in my face. And I'm going to get in there. Well, what happens was it was around daylight savings and we woke up. I remember waking up in the hotel that day being like, huh, it looks a little brighter than normal. It's like, this is a little weird. Looked at my phone. I was like, oh, it's daylight savings. Like we messed up. So we were an hour late this day and Peyton got up in the stand. He was still pretty good because we rushed out there. You know, we were in a panic. I had about a mile over a mile walk in. And Peyton got up in his stand and he kind of watched my headlight, you know, trample off into the forest. And I got to the other spot and man, what sucks about uh, that first week and second week in November hunting, especially uh, in the South and, you know, Kansas is the Midwest, uh, even, even in the Midwest in the first two weeks of November, it's so hot. It was still like 60 or 70 degrees. And I was trucking it going so fast because I wanted to get back in this spot. Well, 
what ended up happening was I got, you know, a hundred yards into this thicker timber. And what I was realizing was, gosh, dang, this is all bedding. Like there's no mature timber over here. It's all short shrubby stuff. And I accessed it with the right wind and I was huffing and puffing. I mean, <sighs> and I had all my climbing stuff, my climbing sticks, my climber, all my camera gear, everything with me that day. And the, uh, as I sat down next in a tree, you know, along the Creek bank, I sat on the ground just to catch my breath for a second. I heard a guy go, you going to sit right there. I was like, what the heck? That guy had already been up in his tree for probably an hour. Accessed it from the complete wrong direction, walked all the way through the bedding, walked in with the complete wrong wind hunt this place. But the one thing he did right that was better than me was he got to his spot on time. So even though he did that wrong, at least he was doing right by getting in at a, at a reasonable time and not un, or actually understanding how daylight savings works. But he said, uh, you going to sit right there? And I was like, I'm sorry, man. I didn't even know you were there. He said, I'll keep moving. He said, I think you should. And he said it kind of like in a kind of like in a way where your dad would say it when you know he's disappointed in you. And he said that to me. I was like, huh. It made me want to get up in the tree and run both of our hunts because mine's already run. I'm not hunting now. I'm going to go try to find another spot, but I have to, I'm limited to walking the opposite direction because I can't keep walking closer to this guy. So I know all about the highly pressured public land thing. Last year, and also last year in Oklahoma, as I was hunting, I was hunting a really good spot. I shot a spot. I've shot a couple of really nice bucks, shot a 131 inch buck on this place on public, and then a 120 inch buck the next year. And uh, so, and I had had having a heck of a week in there. I was seeing double digit deer, and I had shot a doe on opening uh, the first morning we were there in November. That was fun. And I heard something coming up this creek and I was like, oh, here we go. And it sounded like a deer. You know, you can typically tell when it's a squirrel or a deer. This one sounded like a deer. So I sat there. Like, oh, here we go. I, I was turned in my saddle, pivoted, had the camera. I probably actually have it on camera now that I think about it. And here comes a guy in blue jeans and a plaid t-shirt. And he gets probably 70 yards from me. He starts picking up acorns and just smelling them. I was like, hey, 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 hey. He eventually saw me. Oh, threw his hand up, walked out. That's the kind of the joys of that you get on public land. But what I would also say is the place I was hunting is a spot we call the community center. We don't call it the community center for no reason. It's called the community center because people we know have hung trail cameras in there. People we don't know have hung trail cameras in there, but it's a really, really good spot. And when I, uh, when I drew out for a hunt one time in this place, I had a guy set up 200 yards from me playing his, uh, grunt flute. And I had another guy come in on the complete backside, just walking around looking for a spot. So I've ran into so many different people in this spot and I've still managed over the years to shoot 131 and 120 inch buck on public with my bow uh, in this spot. I think the highly pressured public land game is a game I love to play. And the reason I love to play it is it just, it just means something because there is a level of woodman woodsmanship that is required. People get lucky. We have got lucky, man. We have definitely got been a heck of a lot more fortunate than I think our skill. Uh, I think we've, killed more deer than our skill should. I think we've definitely been blessed more uh, than we deserve on public land, but it's a game I love to play because you know, when you kill one, you got him. You weren't hunting him over a corn pile and there's nothing wrong with that. I do it all the time. You weren't hunting him over a winter wheat field that you planted or a brassica plot or a clover plot that you hunted on non-pressured private land in the middle of the rut. You, you didn't kill him that way. You kill the buck in the hardest way to kill it, which is on, on public land, bow hunting, highly pressured. It is, there's very little feelings that I could say to describe how fun it truly is to go in on public land. I've killed uh, several deer bigger than that, 131, but he's probably my favorite buck because I went in on public land. 
shot a doe the day before. Then Jake shoots a 162. We drag it out. We're so tired. We can't even wake up the next morning. We drug it like a mile over the shoulder, up and down hills. We go in the next, I go in the next evening and I shoot that buck at 44 yards. He runs 50 yards, piles up. Me and Jake go take a picture. We killed 293 inches of bone in 24 hours on public land. There's nothing like that. And there, we look at that picture sometimes and it's the header on her Facebook, but we look at that picture sometimes and we say, we will probably never top this, but damn, that was awesome. And there's times 99% of the time when you're hunting public land pressured bow hunting where you're like, this sucks. I want to go home. And for some people like me, I don't have to hunt public. I choose to because I enjoy it. And it's kind of how I grew up in some sense. Uh, or at least learn learning how to hunt. I hunted a lot of private growing up, but I learned how to hunt on public because you kind of have to uh, find a new spots and that sort of thing. But there's nothing better than it. If I think that I hear a lot of folks talk about it, um, a lot of content creators talk about, oh, I never hunt public land. Just I don't I don't care to deal with people. I don't either. I think I enjoy when somebody walks below my tree. It's not really about the people. It's more about the deer. I love hunting a deer that I know someone else could walk in and kill. And killing a good one, especially a mature one on public land with your bow, to me, there's no other, in the whitetail woods, there's no greater accomplishment. And there's people that do it consistently year after year, and it's super impressive, and I enjoy it. And anybody that, you know, heck, if you hunt private, you've never hunted public in your life, just go try it. Just, I, I, I always say people should do both. It's fun. Hunt private for your enjoyment, for fun to see how deer actually should behave. Um, and actually, you know, kind of giving yourself a, a really good chance of killing one, but hunt public for the joy of hunting that you had when you were eight years old. You can shoot anything. You're not worried about age. You're not worried about maturity. You're not worried about planting up the plot and improving the land you're going out and you're doing raw bow hunting on an animal that anybody could kill and you're going in and you're trying to be the one that does it and i don't think there's any any better form of bow hunting it is it is really really fun to hunt them that way um with that let's move on we got three more questions trevor raham says hunter's advantage how to Hunting strategies differ between hunting whitetails in the Midwest South compared to the Northeast. Lifetime Pennsylvania hunting here, hunter here, asking this question based on the fact that most podcasts and sources of advice are based in hunting in the Midwest or Southern deer. How could the previous talking points and strategies vary to the Northeast? That is very interesting. And that's a, that's a really good observation, Trevor, I think that's, I think you're right. I think the majority of kind of deer hunting culture is, is probably Southern and Midwestern. I'd say probably more Midwestern than anything, just because the majority of the big animals every year are coming out of the Midwest. So how does it, how does the hunting strategies differ? I think, uh, in Pennsylvania, New York, Maine, uh, heck probably even New Hampshire, you're talking a lot of big wood stuff and, there's a lot of folks, uh, Boma Bartonic is a good example. Um, there's a lot of folks that do it pretty well. And it, it, I think it's pretty much universally agreed upon in the hunting community that the big woods are the hardest place to kill and mature in a big buck. And one of the reasons for that is the lower deer density. There's a lot of pressure in these places. Um, I think it'd probably be those, be those two things. And, the strategies differ. I can tell you from my experience, I've hunted the mountains quite a bit. There's a lot of, there, there's plenty of mountain ranges in the South, you know, like I would say that somewhere like Alabama or heck even Mississippi, these, or maybe even Georgia, these places with lots of pines and lots of uh, pine plantations and mountains and ranges would probably be somewhat similar to hunting in the Northeast in a lot of ways. Um, now this is from a guy who's never hunted Pennsylvania or New York but just the way that I look at the topography, Arkansas would be another really good example of Arkansas probably looks similar to Pennsylvania and the big woods in some sense. I'm um, in a lot of ways. Uh, the hunting is very traditionally different. Like when we went to Kansas, I remember just zooming out and being like, interesting. There's ag two properties over 
I'm hunting bedding on public. I'm going to be hunting deer that are two properties over on a cut uh, Milo or alfalfa field, and they're going to work their way back to bedding, and I can hunt them that way. That's so odd. I'm used to hunting on public land, fingers, uh, select cuts, clear cuts, transition areas, um, bedding areas that are mixed in with a lot of food. I'm used to hunting the mountain sort of stuff. And that's similar to the big wood stuff that you're probably talking about in Pennsylvania and basically anything non farm country is kind of what I'm talking about. That sort of hunting is hard because there's not a lot that consolidates deer. Like what's the difference between one bowl with red oaks and white oaks with a couple fingers leaning into it next to a Creek versus the next one. In a lot of ways they can look very, very similar and maybe one holds seven deer and the next one holds seven deer. Well, in ag country, you might have a cut Milo field. Like I saw one in mid November last year in Kansas, that was a cut Milo field. And I drove by at like 6 30 PM right before dark. And there were 60 deer on the field. I'd say the majority of the deer in that little area were on that field. That consolidates movement. Doesn't necessarily make it means it's, you know, Hey, you walk out there and shoot one, especially if you're bow hunting, like even having them all on the field, that didn't really, that's kind of just step one of a harder problem. But the strategy is different because in farm country, I feel like that traditional bed to food is a lot easier. And then during the rut, uh, during the rut, you can really find those rut funnels in between food, bedding, uh, water, those sorts of things that is just natural topography. Cause the, tra- the topography in, in farm countries typically, or ag country is not as drastic. Like there's nice rolling hills or dra- uh, where we hunted in Kansas, not super up and down, pretty flat. Uh, so it just kind of makes the, it makes the scouting a little more simplistic, but it doesn't make killing the deer any easier, uh, in my opinion, because and it's all kind of what you're used to. Like you take a guy who's used to ag country, he's probably going to struggle in the big woods. And then you take somebody for that's used to the big woods. Yeah. They might be able to figure it out in ag country, but they're not going to understand the level of details or nuance that happens in those ag situations. So to each their own, I think the strategies are different in that in a uh, big woods country, what I've had uh, a lot of luck doing is just finding readily available food sources like red oaks and white oaks, and then finding topography that I think consolidates deer movement, whether that be funnels or fingers or bowls. Um, somebody people would call benches. That's another thing you could call it hunting that sort of thing instead of a traditional bed to food pattern. I'm just hunting areas that are topography and food based, Whereas I think you get a little bit more of that kind of TV style, traditional Midwestern hunting when you get to hunt in ag country. Uh, and I think they're just two very different mediums, but I love them both. I would, if you like whitetails at all, you should try both. I would, I would recommend it. So that's what I would say. The strategies are completely different, but, um, you're right. A lot of the advice is going to be about hunting Midwest and Southern deer and, uh, you know, Take those, uh, take those points with a grain of salt. That's just my experience. Devin Copeland says arrow quality levels, gold tip hunters versus Easton axis, et cetera. Does it make a big enough difference to justify the cost of the more expensive arrow? This is interesting. I've had, a. Uh, we recently talked to Ed Ashby on the podcast and, uh, the number one factor that we talked about with the 12 factors of penetration uh, was structural integrity. And that just doesn't, that doesn't just have to do with the broadhead. It has to do with all the components. So it has to do with the insert. If the insert breaks, the arrow is going to quit penetrating. If the shaft breaks in a certain portion, the arrow is probably going to quit penetrating. Um, so as the shaft, the lining, the insert, the broadhead, structural integrity is, is a really big issue. And, you know, there's, between gold tip, the two that you listed are gold tip and Easton. Um, I think the best that you can do is trust brand name. So whether it's Exodus or gold tip or Easton, you can trust in the fact that those are big brands that produce arrows. Um, are they going to care that 
one of your arrows broke and lost you the biggest buck of your life? No, probably not. You're probably not going to get a call back about that. But it's hard when we were talking to Ed, it was hard. Um, I asked him, you know, structural integrity matters, quality of components, putting the arrow together matter. How does someone that's a general consumer understand what's good and what's bad? And Ed was like, herein lies one of the problems with the hunting industry and hunting products is you don't know. You don't know if that brass insert is good. You don't know if it's a good component. So is it worth paying $80 a dozen or moving up to, um, you know, an Axis or an FMJ that is, you know, 160 or $200 a dozen? That question is, I don't know. I don't understand the quality of the components. I think the only way to understand if it's worth it is to do your own testing, is to understand it. I have always been one of the people. I've never really cheaped out on arrows. I've shot East End FMJs for a long time. Uh, I've shot gold or I shot gold tip. I've shot Carbon Express, and then uh, more recently, I'm shooting the Exodus uh, MMTs, which I've killed five deer with, a black bear with, a pig with. So I shot seven animals this last year with it, and I've never had an issue. I've never broken an arrow on an MMT yet. So, and one of Exodus's things is their quality components. They, they source really high quality components. So the reality is, man, is you, I think the question or the answer to, is it worth going with a more expensive arrows? I don't know. It may be, it may not be. I think it's all personal experience. It's hard to judge the quality of the components because they could tell you that they're made out of freaking gold. And how, you, how are you going to know? Unless you take them apart and look and test, waste some arrows. So I don't know, man. I think the best you can do on that front is is go with brand and spend on an arrow what you can afford. If you can afford a, a set of $200, uh, a dozen arrows, um, like the Exodus MMTs are, I would. I would get the absolute best equipment that I could afford. Uh, but if you if you can't afford a, a set more than six or eighty bucks, there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, just shoot a, you know, a really good broadhead, shoot something with structural integrity. And I, I can't. I don't know if the cost is uh, is worth it. I think that's a very interesting question. I think you're on the right line of thinking, but I don't know the answer to it. And the uh, last question that we got is Jay Woodsman. He said, when is Charles Beatty coming back? Uh, the long and the short of Charles Beatty coming back on the podcast is I don't know. Um, we've messaged with Charles a little bit. He sent us a few messages uh, that he wants to do a podcast. I have no idea on um, when part two is coming out of his book. Uh, if you guys want to speak with him, I'm sure – Dude has like 10,000 followers on Instagram. He's very active on there too. So if you guys want to speak with Charlie, my recommendation um, on the book would be to uh, message him and see when that is coming. And then when we will do a podcast probably again with him when uh, the second book comes out. Because we've done several with him. I'm on the first. Want to keep it fresh. Want to keep it entertaining. Uh, we don't want to beat a, beat a horse dead, you know. Uh, so... With that, I think that's going to conclude the episode. We are right before deer season, but we are not to the point um, of no return. So if you guys still need um, some stuff for deer season, whether that be arrows or trail cameras, uh, check out our sponsor, Exodus uh, Outdoor Gear. Uh, use code HA15 at checkout. That'll get you 15% off anything in their store, whether that's apparel or trail cams, solar panels, arrows, we use their stuff and it's really quality built and uh, we appreciate the partnership with them. And the last one that I would mention was go check our, out our sponsor out on a limb manufacturing. Um, you can go to out on out on a limb, mfg.com uh, use code H N T a 10 for 10% off anything at their store. They have some awesome stuff, especially for the public land run and gun guy, whether it's saddle platforms or I use their Shakar slot climbing sticks. I've used the same pair of climbing sticks for the past like three or four years and they barely have a freaking scratch on them. They're still going strong. Uh, they make a lot of really, really good gear. Lightweight, uh, hang on tree stands, trail camera mounts. They do it all. And they're 100% made in the USA, made in Oklahoma. Uh, they're a local company. 
we really appre- uh, appreciate Matt and uh, and Chase over there. They they do a fantastic job, and they actually came up with a, just a really cool uh, bow holder that they sent us a few of. Uh, it's for guys on public land that don't want to screw in. You can't or you can't screw in or saw limbs on public land. So it's a bow holder that just straps around the tree, and it has a it has a strap on it, and it makes it super easy to just hang your bow instead of drilling it into the tree. So I know uh, we're about two weeks before season. So we're just in that time frame where if you order stuff, you're still going to get it before season. So go check out our sponsors. We really appreciate you guys checking out the podcast every single week. Like I said, we've uh, got some exciting stuff coming up. We're going to do an episode about the Nebraska mule deer and white tail hunt that we did. And then on top of that, I'll tease it just a little bit, but we have a five part podcast series coming up about public land hunting. Last year we did one called public land one Oh one. I think we did eight episodes all about public land hunting and our experiences, how to hunt public land, the etiquette of it, how to find public land, all those sorts of things. And this week or this uh, year, we're going to do something a little bit different. It's going to be more focused on kind of how to hunt public land in different scenarios. So I hope you guys enjoy it. That one's going to be coming out sometime in the next couple of weeks. There'll be five episodes of that. And then we got some exciting guests on the way as always, but I thank you guys so much for checking out the podcast. If you enjoyed it, go leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast. And uh, if you're on YouTube, make sure to like the video, share it, and subscribe to the channel. We appreciate you guys. We love you guys so much. Uh, and we'll catch you in the next one. And since Jake isn't here, I'll say it for him. Jesus loves you. Bye. Thank you guys so much for checking out the Hunter's Advantage podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to the podcast. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you in the next episode.